Putin is an extremely dangerous guy and his regime follows a historical pattern in Russia, which is the uh, impotence and um, incapa incapacity of reforming the country. It gets more and more autocratic and at the end they are waging war. And this narrative that Putin is this highly dangerous guy who puts the opposition in prison, he is an aggressive um, um, dictator, it's an all-pervading view. Even in reasonable circles in Switzerland, for example, if you talk to entrepreneurs, to, to people who have traveled the world, for them, just emotionally, this Putin is such a dangerous guy that they sympathize um, emotionally with this uh, American containment policy or NATO enlargement policy. What would you say to these people who say, well, Professor Sachs, I mean, he's locking up uh, the opposition. He's a he's an autocrat. He has become a dictator. It's a terrible regime. We have to um, stop this man. Well, I think it is a, a relatively authoritarian regime, but that doesn't mean that it is uh, one that is uh, out to make war <clears throat> in uh, its uh, neighborhood. It's Russia that was invaded by the West so many times and by all these wonderful democracies. <laughs> so this idea that uh, you know Russia's uh, authoritarian and therefore militaristic and were democracies and therefore is peaceful is preposterous. The most violent country in the world in the 19th century by far was Britain, uh, the most democratic, but uh, it used its internal democracy to cheerlead uh, building a global empire. The United States has been engaged in more wars than any other country since 1950. We're a democracy, but we're completely violent in overthrowing dozens of governments in launching wars of choice all over the world, in having 800 military bases uh, overseas. So it's simple-minded to say, oh, well, that's just a Russian tradition. Yeah, Russian tradition is to have been invaded by Napoleon. Russian tradition has been to have been invaded by Britain and France in the first Crimean War, which is, by the way, was fought on exactly the same principles as this war is fought, because the idea of Palmerston was blockade Russia in the Black Sea, destroy its uh, military capacity, naval capacity in the Black Sea, surround Russia in the Black Sea, and Russia doesn't threaten our empire. That was Palmerston's idea, very clear. Uh, basically, he was the great imperialist of his age. And uh, he just wanted to go on, by the way, after uh, the fall of Sevastopol in 1856, he wanted to go on to the Caucasus, just like uh, expanding NATO to Georgia, by the way. Same model. Brzezinski just took the, uh, took the Palmerston model because geography doesn't change. Uh, and uh, Russia was invaded by Hitler uh, mm -hmm. and uh, suffered more loss than any other place on the planet. And then, <laughs> this is a long story, but the United States after World War II, instead of negotiating a peace arrangement with the Soviet Union, unilaterally decided to remilitarize Russia, uh, remilitarize Germany, excuse me. And Kennan was absolutely against this policy. Kennan said, just like Austria is neutral, if Germany is neutral, the Cold War can end. But mm -hmm. the United States didn't want it that way. Uh, mm -hmm. So all of this phony history and the of, about uh, Russia's military history and so forth. Russia is a country that was constantly invaded from the outside, mostly from the West, uh, but of course, uh, during the Golden Horde from the East, from the mm -hmm. Mongols. And the issue for Russia in the mindset of the state leaders of Russia is 
we are threatened at our borders, period. And so that's why Ukrainian neutrality is really a good idea. Because mm -hmm. if you really want the history, the history is Russia is always looking for safe space because it's always worried about outside invasion coming in. And now with respect to Putin, the truth is, even with all of the bad behavior of the United States in the 1990s, Putin came in as a friend of Europe and the United States. And anyone that knows anything about the early years of the 2000s knows that to be true, and I know it firsthand. And I know many European leaders that had absolutely good, fruitful relations with Putin. And have I've you spoken- met, Have you met uh, President Putin? Also? Of course, uh -huh. yes. I don't what's have, your impression? What's your personal impression? I mean, you met Gorbachev, I, you I, met Kelsey. Yeah, I really loved Gorbachev. Uh, I, I wouldn't say the same about Putin, but I don't know him. But Gorbachev I loved because uh, he was really a man of peace. Uh, and uh, Yeltsin, I liked. Uh, I wish he had stayed sober more often. Uh, it would have uh, really helped the world. Um, but he wanted normalcy. And I wanted to help him get that. And the United States just could not take yes for an answer on either case. Uh, the United States attitude was, they're on the other side. We're the sole superpower. We beat them. We can do what we want. That's the arrogance that has gotten us into this complete mess. And all these claims about, about Putin being intrinsically dangerous, European leaders absolutely can tell they were working with him fruitfully in for many, many years. And Europeans cheated, <laughs> cheated mm. repeatedly. Where's the Minsk II agreements? Even Merkel says so. I mean, it's shocking what she said. I don't even mm. believe it uh, in, in the way she said it. It was so garish. But you in mean any this, event, this quote in Die Zeit where she said, "Yeah, I, I think it's scarcity. we just wanted to buy time to." Be yeah, I think I, I think it was important. taken a little bit out of context because she's not so cynical, actually, uh, from all my experience. But but the idea that Putin's all bad and we're all wonderful—that's our narrative every day. That's so deadly, hmm. mainly for Ukraine because it's so phony. I talked. I was in uh, in Moscow a few months ago. I talked to a lot of people, and I had uh, some interesting conversations. And one um, eminent scholar told me, "You know, Putin has been too trustful of the West for too long. He was a he was a Westernized leader, and I that was this man. I criticized Putin all the time for not being enough pro Russia. He was too much pro West." Is that a, an impression you have that Putin was really a guy who put his hopes into the trustfulness, trustworthiness of the West? Well, I think Gorbachev, Yeltsin and Putin all did that. And this is a question for, uh, you know, Gorbachev uh, um, and NATO enlargement. There's no <laughs> question that uh, Gorbachev was told over and over again by James Baker, by Hans Dietrich Genscher, uh, by uh, uh, the Secretary General of NATO, we won't move one inch. We will hmm. never take advantage of you. And then he, he didn't put it in writing. Uh, he really didn't put it in writing, but there's a huge amount in writing in, in the uh, Western mm -hmm. archival material about all the promises that were made, and they were all blown off immediately. Mm -hmm. So the West was really untrustworthy. Mm -hmm. And then in 1999, NATO bombed Serbia on a ruse, because it is a ruse, and if you really go to the deep story of the bombing and uh, and uh, the actually the internal competition between Madeleine Albright and uh, and uh, um, Richard Holbrook about who was going to be Secretary of State in the next administration, who could be tougher. Oh, it's unbelievable. We bombed Serbia for weeks. And that was a little bit of a downer. But even then, 
Putin stayed with us. Then in 2002, the United States unilaterally walked away from the anti-ballistic missile treaty. Even mm -hmm. then, Putin stayed with us. I think the final blow was was basically 2008, uh, mm -hmm. this uh, NATO business uh, in, uh, in the Bucharest summit. I think that was uh, really the end of of mm -hmm. any trust. But he went ahead with the you know uh, with Minsk, and uh, I think he believed that the Normandy process of Germany and France would stand up and actually do something. Mm -hmm. And we oh. know that behind the scenes, it was the Minsk agreement was completely blown off by all of the powers that be. So <laughs> I, I think that there are a lot of Russians who just uh, view this completely the opposite of the way that we are fed uh, mm -hmm. in uh, in the Western media. I don't think you have to view it all one way or all another way, but you do have to step back and understand the history of this. And the most fundamental point I would make is Ukraine should be neutral, should have remained neutral, mm -hmm. should have, uh, and we should have listened to a valid Russian red line. And I will emphasize both red line and a valid one. We would never tolerate uh, Mexico joining a military alliance with China or Russia, no matter what open door, what principles, what never. And it's perfectly understandable that Russia also would not tolerate this. And by the way, again, just to beat uh, what should be obvious <laughs> to, <laughs> to, to completion, Bill Burns, who is a very intelligent person and now our CIA director. Ambassador course, in Moscow. Yeah, in 2008, he wrote the clearest possible memo. Niet means niet. Don't do this, NATO enlargement. It's not just Putin. It's the entire Russian political class. Everybody objects to it. The academics, the scholars, the scientists, the politicians, the pro-Putin side, the anti-Putin side, everybody is against this. And as typical for the US, first of all, the memo was secret, so the American people were never told anything. Second, it uh, was only revealed by uh, Assange, uh, by WikiLeaks. Uh, so that's why we have to lock up Assange, <laughs> because uh, he told Americans the truth. Third, even when it's there now for everyone to read, because you can just go Google it uh, and read it, the New York Times wouldn't dream of mentioning it in all of the commentary about this war uh, since uh, 2014, Amazing. much less since 2021. Amazing. Going back to the war, how big is the chance of a nuclear escalation or some other forms of escalation? For example, if the um, Ukrainian forces would really crumble, would NATO, would the Americans just stand by and let uh, Putin win this war? And on the other hand, uh, do you see any perspective of uh, tactical nuclear weapons uh, you know, deployment by the Russians. How is the escalation danger of this war at the moment? When Obama talked about escalatory dominance of Russia, he meant that if Russia were imperiled, it would escalate to nuclear war. I believe that to be true. And it's been said countless times now by Medvedev, by other Russian leaders, uh, in uh, not not so hidden terms by Putin, and so on. If Russia were deeply endangered, it would escalate and up to and including uh, nuclear weapons uh, used in Ukraine. Uh, if Russia were to lose Crimea or to be threatened to be overrun in Crimea, which is the direct war aim right now of Ukraine. Probably 
not achievable and it's a uh, uh, infeasibility probably keeps the world alive uh, because if it were feasible uh, or if the United States and uh, UK somehow made it feasible through uh, say uh, NATO uh, jets uh, directly flying missions uh, to support uh, Ukrainian infantry, something that's not unthinkable, um, there would be a real chance of nuclear escalation. This is clear. The barrier between non-nuclear and nuclear is not very bright, is not a very bright line, history has told us repeatedly. Uh, we have come close to nuclear war on several occasions, and there are generals in the U.S., who believe in using nuclear war. We don't have a no first strike policy. Uh, and Russia is on uh, tenterhooks about the possibility of being attacked. So terrible accidents can happen, miscalculations can happen, or massive failures on one side or another can happen. And right now it seems less likely be, that uh, it would be a result of a collapse of the Russian military that would lead to this. You raise a very good question, what if Ukraine were to collapse on the other side, which is a real possibility, what would uh, the West do? Uh, and by the West, all we mean ever is the US security establishment, because there is no other independent voice except the UK standing and cheerleading whatever the US says do 10 times more because uh, they still love their empire. Um, but uh, that would be a real question. And, and my, my uh, answer to that would be that I would hope that Russia would have some forbearance uh, and uh, know to stop before uh, provoking something extraordinarily dangerous because then it would be in Russia's hands. And there's a wonderful quote, uh, which I'm just looking up right now, a, a famous line from Kennedy's famous uh, peace speech on June 10, 1963. He said, above all, while defending our own vital interests, nuclear powers must avert those confrontations which bring an adversary to a choice of either a humiliating retreat or a nuclear war. To adopt that kind of course in the nuclear age would be evidence only of the bankruptcies of our policies or of a collective death wish for the world. And I, I may have garbled a word or two, we can correct it in the, <laughs> but, but the point is um, what I find remarkable about that statement, and I've not only studied that speech <laughs> relentlessly, but wrote a book about it actually, Kennedy talks a lot about all the dangers, but he says above all, and in saying above all, he really means above all, avert those confrontations which put a nuclear power at the choice of a humiliating retreat or a nuclear war. And we don't seem to understand that almost at all. Mm -hmm. Or there are enough cheerleaders that say, oh, it's a bluff. Uh, don't worry about that. Don't don't be black, nu nuclear blackmail and so on. Kennedy's telling us something extraordinarily important. He lived through the missile crisis. He and Khrushchev enabled the world to survive that crisis and what he's telling us above all is avoid such confrontations. And the US is incompetent in this right now, in that I'm told when I complain to senior politicians in Washington about the dangers, they tell me privately, no, 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 Jeff, believe me, we're telling the Ukrainians, uh, you know, don't take back uh, Crimea. That's not that's not the U.S. goal and so forth. That's what I hear, quote unquote, privately. 
But of course, the Ukrainian goal is we're going to take back every inch, including Crimea and so on. So who's telling the truth in this? The answer is nobody knows because it's all a large group of people each playing their own game. It's extraordinarily dangerous what's going on. Could it escalate to nuclear war? It damn sure that it could, without question. What is, just to nail it down, what is at the moment, in your eyes, what does Putin want? What is his primary objective or what is his goal at the moment, if you would try to characterize that? What does he want now? I think he wants uh, Russian security. He wants to make sure that NATO never comes close uh, to uh, the border with Ukraine. Uh, he wants uh, Biden to say that so that this isn't uh, and to be part of a globally recognized mm -hmm. commitment. Um, and he wants to hold Crimea for sure. Uh, and what's now, you know, uh, harder to assess is territorially, what about the rest? Because after, again, losing tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands of people, who knows, uh, at what was not originally a territorial uh, war, uh, we don't know what... Uh, we don't we don't know what it is exactly right now uh the the russians have just said again a couple of days ago that their aims are uh no nato enlargement uh holding the territories that they've annexed which mm -hmm. means uh, the four regions uh, together with the uh, crimea and denazification of the ukrainian government whatever specifically that means what do i think is at the core of this i think at the core of this is uh as, as i keep saying one is the russian border and nato that to my mind is the most decisive element of all second is crimea which is never going back and interestingly just as and, and third is something about the rest of the territories. I don't think that Kherson and Zaporizhia are, you know, profound issues for Russia, though they now have been annexed uh, mm -hmm. and so on. Uh, the Donbass is much more complicated. What was on the table a year ago was much better than what's on the table, uh, what is easy to achieve in negotiations. Now, what was on the table in December 2017 would have kept Ukraine basically whole, except for Crimea, and peaceful. And that's what should have been accepted <laughs> at that moment, because the agreement was there to be made. And that's when I begged the White House, <laughs> negotiate now, because what Putin is saying is absolutely reasonable within, uh, uh, within uh, um, our negotiating uh, sphere. What does President Biden want? What would you say is the primary goal of the United States government? Right now, he wants to win re-election. Mm. I think that's the primary goal. The second goal is... Uh, Not well, losing let, faith in the Ukraine. Yeah, yeah. Let, let's put it this way. Obviously, Ukraine is not a existential issue for the United States. Uh, it's not even close to the issue that it is for Russia. So what does the United States really want? Uh, Biden, first of all, wants to win re-election. So, so many of our wars are paced by the political cycle. This is the most basic point. And just like the Vietnam War kept going on and on and on because there was always an election coming, uh, this is the, the main point. Second, of course, Biden wants the United States to stand tall and lead the free world. Uh, so uh, he doesn't, you know, in principle, 
we got a lot of people in the U.S. political class who really believe, uh, hell, no one can tell us what to do, where to go, where NATO should go. We don't have to listen to any of them. Uh, and then there's a group that really believes, I think it's almost a kind of madness, but I mean, it is a kind of madness. We got to stand st tall in Ukraine because we have to send a strong signal to China. That's actually a group, that's actually a view by people who are chronologically grownups. Uh, mm -hmm. Although intellectually, I would say mm -hmm. disgraceful uh, mm -hmm. because the confusion on these issues is so unbelievably huge. But that's also another view. But what mm -hmm. does Biden really want right now? He wants to get out of this without uh, losing political no. support. No. That's what he really wants. Mm -hmm. 